And we are back for another episode of AlphaCast. I'm Mike Winner, and I'm here as always with Dr. Bear Paul Lando up here on the Smith River on a beautiful Memorial Day weekend. We've had some sunshine and lovely weather today, and it's great to do a special weekend AlphaCast. We've got a really fun guest on today from the land down under from Australia, Tom Barnett. And this is one that I've been looking forward to ever since I saw Tom's video go viral a few months back, talking about terrain theory versus germ theory, and, um, and then really just kind of started researching him and just loving everything he's all about. So i um, really excited to have him on and just have a great conversation today. For, you, for those that don't know, um, actually, we're celebrating this weekend too because we're launching uh, Alphabetic 2.0 on Monday. It's our, uh, it's about six months of work to put out this new website, the new product lines and everything, our new aesthetic, our, the agricultural co-op and everything we're doing. So um, we're doing this special alpha cast this weekend to kind of uh, get the word out and celebrate uh, all the hard work we've been doing and uh, having somebody like Tom on is, uh, I can't think of a better person. So uh, Tom, uh, welcome. I'll give you a little background just for those who don't know who he is. Um, Tom has become uh, quite the media sensation of late for his straightforward and insightful commentaries on the solutions for these intense times. Tom is the founder of Global Biodynamics, which has become an impactful voice in the world of education, health, finance, organic farming, conservation, and more. The art of thinking for oneself is a central theme in the seminars, retreats, and corporate events sponsored by Global Biodynamics. And, tom- and right now, we'll uh, have a front row seat as Tom comes in here and to talk about his eclectic background as a facilitator, holistic healing, education, business, athletics, and everything else he's doing. How you doing uh, Sunday morning for you, huh? Tom, how you doing today? Doing really well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have Good you. Good to see you, Tom. How are you, Barry? Thanks for being on with us. So you're, um, you're in Byron Bay, are you? Yeah, I'm in the uh, really close to Byron Bay, yeah. It's a good part of the world. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, wonderful. And uh, I have a little Byron Bay story. Uh, in about 1981, um, you know, I had my first private practice, and we're just looking for a good place in the world to live and raise our kids. And uh, we're, of course, it had to have good surf because that's pretty much what we do is we fall surf around the world. So we uh, filed for immigration to Australia, and our whole uh, intention was to move to Byron Bay because that was like the happening little place. And I made the transition from conventional into alternative health at that point. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a little conscious network there. And it's pretty laid back back in those days. I don't know if it's, uh, if it's developed quite a bit since then. I'm sure it has like the rest of the world. But um, we're on our way there to check it out, you know, after we're accepted. And, and I always wanted to surf in Fiji. So we ended up in Fiji. <laughs> and I love Fiji so much that I never left. I had a little... Uh, job offer there uh, overseeing this uh, kind of health retreat in, in exchange uh, at a work visa for doing emergency care with this village in this remote part of the island and and we we ultimately ended up in Hawaii but anyway uh, never got to see Byron Bay because we got waylaid in Fiji and uh, but the surf was great in Fiji so we had a great time so great to have you here and you know God there's so many things we have in common uh, you know, I know everybody's talking about viruses and, and, and lockdowns and all that sort of thing. Uh, I'm just as happy talking about surfing myself, but um, let's just, uh, you know, we'll let you take us wherever you want. And you have a lot of knowledge. You've, you've accomplished a lot of things. So, so please, just wherever you want to start and, and we'll jump in. Yeah, sure. All right. Well, first of all, that Fiji thing sounds like heaven to me i've always wanted to go there and uh you know find a little secluded part away from the crowded spots like uh, cloud break and restaurants and things but there's so many other islands there i'd love to go surf through there for take a year and just go surf and explore and hang out with the natives and things it'd be great but um yeah tabarilla wasn't happening back when i was there and uh Mm -hmm. a a friend of ours manages tabarilla now uh, but anyway, yeah. yeah, we just uh, made our own way back then. In fact, a lot of places where we, we went, we were the first uh, outsiders to be surfing there. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No, that's right. I mean, it's actually, you know, we could go there because there's, um, I've been to a few places in the Pacific Islands where people still have the ability to live somewhat uh, naturally the way they have for, you know, a long time. 
And it's really interesting to see that it's the people that are still able to live how they have for centuries are still living in really vibrant health. They don't have these outbreaks of diseases and so think, uh, diseases and such that we're told that we have outbreaks of, except for the ones that have been introduced to Western foods and Western medicines. They do tend to have illnesses. They have a lot of uh, incidences of diabetes, uh, cancers. They have, um, you know, I think it was Samoa that had the measles outbreaks last year, but that was only on the back of a lot of vaccines being taken into the area. So, <laughs> you know, besides that, yeah. these people don't have, you know, they don't have these so-called coronavirus outbreaks and things when they're left to their natural environment and their natural way of being. And that I think is a really good indication when people, you know, they're not really familiar with the terrain uh, theory. I mean, I don't call it a theory. I know it's termed a theory, but I don't really think it's a theory at all. But <laughs> the whole idea of, you know, uh, our internal environment creating our state of disease or, you know, health or whatever, I think that's no more apparent than when you see people living, native peoples living in their natural environment because these things just don't seem to exist for them. Sure, they have periods of illnesses, but they're not looked at the same way that we look at them and they don't go through it, you know, they don't spread like the way that we're told that disease spreads in our Western culture. Yeah, and I know that about you, you know, you seek to just live an authentic lifestyle and that's, uh, you know, what always motivated my wife and myself. We just didn't buy into, you know, living in, uh, in the Western style. It was interesting. Uh, we were out in this, uh, uh, village in Fiji and uh, a friend of ours from the States was visiting at the time. And so she started asking these villagers questions. One of the questions, you know, we were there and they had these huge papayas and she said, geez, how long does it take to grow a papaya like that? And, and the Fijian just kind of looked around and said, I don't know. I never thought about it. You know, they're just, their mindset is not into time frames, and, you know, they just live. And, and, you know, you can meet a Fijian in the street that maybe you met five years ago, just for a, a very brief encounter. And they'll re they're so present that they'll remember every detail about you, about the conversation. You know, they're just not mentally distracted like we are. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've seen that in, in other places too. I know Fijians are renowned for their hospitality and friendliness as well. So that probably goes a long way. Yeah, oh, I, yeah. Uh, they're wonderful I, uh, people. <clears throat> I actually uh, honeymooned with my, my wife and I in Fiji. So uh, we, on a little island called Vatulele, you fly into. And uh, we, uh, man, it was an amazing time. And I will say those uh, Fijians have the biggest feet I've ever seen and are some of the best free divers <laughs> too. I mean, diving down yeah. hundreds and hundreds of feet, no problem. Here we are in scuba and stuff, and they're just free diving. Um, but amazing people, I agree. And isn't that funny, Tom, how you look at these indigenous populations and they're not riddled with all these, um, quote unquote, diseases, uh, you know, all these autoimmune issues and neurological issues. And how, I mean, how have we been sold down this, this idea that um, man needs to intervene all the time uh, and that we're at, we talk about this a lot in the show, that we're like at the pinnacle of our civilization, right? It's never been better due to all the wonderful um, things that science and, and the Western world has brought to the world. And yet, it seems like if you look at the average Joe in the West, um, you know, there's obesity, there's uh, the, now we've seen even in the mainstream showing decreasing um, lifespan and overall depression rates, suicides up. I mean, we could go down the line here. And then you look at somebody on a, on a remote island, and while they might not have uh, access to, uh, you know, 24-7 uh, internet feeds and, and a lot of the cool kind of input we get, uh, they seem pretty darn happy and pretty healthy too, you know? What do you think about yeah. that? I mean, you kind of you talked about it, but in your, in your experience, where are we at right now in this paradigm and, and where can we go as Westerners and in the modern world? I mean, it's hard to just turn back the clock, but it seems like we, and I hate to use this word crisis because they like to use it uh, to control and manipulate with fear. But let's be frank, we are in a bit of a crisis here and with everything you do at Global Bio, Biodynamics and stuff, what are some remedies that you're looking at here to try to kind of uh, remediate these issues that we're dealing with? Yeah, well, I think 
everything comes down to balance. You know, every, every uh, individual that I've dealt with that's had mental or physical health issues or you know, whatever's going on, it's always that they're out of balance. And then through their own journey, they find that the more that they get back to remembering the older ways, the better they become in their health and their mindset, uh, in their relationships and everything else. So I think, um, I mean, I don't quite see what we're facing as a crisis. I just see everything as just an event happening. We experience it the way that we, I guess, choose to experience it. We do have a choice how we experience anything. So uh, it's always been when people have the chance to actually observe themselves and observe the events that are happening, that's when they can start making the, the decisions to, I guess, experience it a different way or change something about themselves or help to change something about the world around them. So that only can come from being able to stop and observe what's going on. If you're constantly caught up in what's going on, you're essentially part of that snowball and it's kind of hard to get out. So the first step is to actually take some pause and have a look at what's going on and have a look at yourself and how you're interacting with what's going on and make some decisions from there. So, um, you know, I've seen what we're dealing with now. Obviously there's some, uh, parts about it that are a little worrying for a lot of people. You know, we're looking at perhaps mandatory vaccines, uh, huge restrictions on travel. You know, a lot of people might not to go, not, might not get to go and experience Fiji, for example, in the next foreseeable future. So uh, we're, we're looking at that, but there's also solutions to that. So it comes down to educating yourself on, you know, what your rights are, um, how things are structured and, and how you can kind of play that game. Because once you start to understand I guess the nature of the game that we're involved in, then you can start to learn how to play it a little better and more to your advantage. So, um, and that comes down to your, your own personal health and well-being as well. I think once you start to learn how things work, then you have a lot more control um, over that, you know, but you know, I, well, I think I was 19 the first time I went to Indonesia and I saw what you were talking about my first hand. I saw kids there that were very happy. They had literally nothing. We were on a beach in the middle of Sumatra, the middle of nowhere. And these kids, 20 or 30 of them, were just kicking around a, a lump of kind of uh, burnt out wood, like black it was a soccer ball, but it wasn't a ball. None of them were fighting over it. None of them were, uh, you know, whinging and crying and whatever else. They all were very peaceful kids, having a great time, were very present. And compare that to what we see in our Western culture, you know, I, I don't see that level of contentedness and happiness in a lot of kids, um, the happiest kids I see are the ones that are out in nature the most, the ones that I see out surfing, the ones that I see out playing in the streets, which is stuff that we all did when we were kids. But th this day and age, you know, everyone's scared of strangers and whatever, the sun. <laughs> now, <laughs> you can't, sun kids. now you can't and, even uh, leave your house if you live in the suburbs around here in the States, you know? Yeah. So um, there's a lot, there's a lot going on that's kind of really removing us from where we came from. And the further I think that we keep getting removed from our roots and our, our nature and the nature around us, the further we are removed from that, that's the degree to which we will experience discomfort, we'll experience uh, disharmony, unhappiness, and, uh, and a sense of a real unknowing or a, a displacement. We feel a displacement from the world around us and from ourselves. The closer... I've found a person is to being in connection with the world around them, which is essentially a connection to nature, the closer they are connected to themselves. And therefore, no matter what's going on, they don't have depression. They don't have, uh, you know, physical disease. They don't have a lot of the uh, ailments that afflict modern and in particular Western culture. Uh, something that has a big part to do with that is, you know, modern lifestyles, modern diets, modern medicines. While, I do have a lot of respect for modern medicine because if you break a leg or, you know, a family member has just had a car accident, modern medicine can help you be with that, your loved ones for at least, pro, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, positives to it, but for the most part, there's a lot of negatives to it. It really does take us out of our nature and, and um, it kind of really waters us down. So it was, uh, Again, when I was around 19, 20, when I came back from Indonesia, that's when I found out about Weston Price and his book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, which was written in uh, 1929. So that's when I started finding out a lot more about um, people who were still living natural lives compared to those that were introduced to Western foods, Western lifestyles and Western medicines and the effect that it had on these native cultures and how it deteriorated them very quickly within one generation. And... Uh, that's what also led me to the work of Rudolf Steiner and other people. And that led me down that whole finding out about terrain theory and 
everything else. You know, at that stage, I was university educated. So I had thought we catch viruses. I had thought, you know, everything that modern medicine tells us. But then when I was out seeing the evidence to the contrary and not just having my head buried in books, you know, going out into the real world and seeing that kind of evidence, that's what really changed things for me. Brilliant. I, I will say when one you live in nature, it just becomes, go ahead, Mike. Um, I was just going to say one thing real quick. Um, and I really loved your reply when I said crisis and you said, really, it's all about your perspective and that thank you for correcting me there. Cause that's something we talk about all the time, Tom, and really, you know, even it's, it's tough cause it's constantly over our head, right? The tracking's coming, the vaccines are coming, the, the deep state, the technocracy, you know, it's uh, it can seem pretty, pretty overbearing, yeah. but in the end you make, uh, you make a beautiful point. It's all about taking a breath, stepping back. And, um, and really uh, making decisions for yourself because it is our narrative, it's our life, it's our hero's journey, and we are the ones empowered and in control. Go ahead, Bear. Yeah, I was just going to say that when you live in nature, you, you observe nature's processes. You also just intuitively understand your body as uh, a part of nature, and you have a whole different perspective on how to take care of yourself is at the same time, you know, you, you wouldn't dream of uh, doing things that doctors tell the mainstream folks to do these days. It's just, um, it's counterintuitive. And, um, and, and also, you know, you, you don't have that fear uh, when, you know, when you're in nature, you know, we, we have a lot of large animals around here and, you know, I feel more comfortable walking around here knowing that there's lions and bears and you see them all the time. Uh, you know, where I get a little nervous is, is if we occasionally go into a city setting and, you know, I'm more wary of the people, you know, there's more to worry about there. So, um, yeah, you just become very comfortable. And I think because of that, you also become comfortable in your own skin and you just aren't afraid of things, uh, you know that nature takes care of itself. You know that it's a, it's a, it's a normal, uh, normally self-correcting, self-maintaining system, and it always writes itself. It's always seeking balance. Uh, that was my experience in medicine. You know, because I was uh, started out more in emergency medical services. And, and you're right. You know, we did a lot of good things, helped a lot of people. But when you look at uh, emergency medicine compared to the whole. Uh, the whole realm of medicine is just a very small part of it. But what we have now is the medical system showcases that and we, you know, all rightfully um, kind of view that as life saving and, 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 and just, uh, you know, a wonderful tool. But then when you look at the bulk of what uh, medicine does and what people go to medical doctors for, uh, you know, you still have that same mindset, but, taking care of your health is not a crisis. And what we do now is, uh, you know, just regular medical care, uh, routine medical, you know, practices are all about crisis intervention. And if there isn't a crisis, they'll create one. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not that, it's not that complicated. And the more we go back uh, away from the simplicity of nature, uh, the more we lose it. And that's why everybody's afraid of this, you know, in my opinion, um, an invisible terrorist right now, which doesn't exist at all the way people think it does. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I think it's important to know too that most people seem to think that what we've seen is pretty much just a warm up for what's to come. So that's why it's really important now if people are starting to, you know, catch on to this kind of thing that you really learn to take that responsibility for your own health and your own thoughts, because I think with what we're going to see in the future, it's going to be more important now than ever. Then we really understand our bodies and ourselves and get very comfortable inside of ourselves, uh, have that trust in nature. And I've said it in plenty of interviews, you know, nature's not out to kill us. There's this weird idea, which is really only in the last century that's come about that nature somehow is out to get us. <laughs> And that without vaccines and medicines and, and lockdowns, we somehow can't survive. But people can't seem to make this connection between how, how have we survived through famines, floods, earthquakes, fires, and whatever else for however long we've been on this earth. If, if we were so easily taken out by nature, how would we be here? 
you know, how have we managed to continue to grow our population exponentially despite whatever's happened in the past without vaccines and things which have only been made available in the last really century. I know that I know they've developed before that, but you know, the mass kind of production and, and uh, the push of, the, of these modern medicines, it's only a new thing. And the world still got to five or six billion before that came about, you know. And then it's not really, to me, nothing's about numbers, you know, it's also about the quality. You know, you see a lot of people that they can live to, you know, old age, but they kind of died when they were 30 or 40. They haven't really been alive since then because they're sick. They don't, they don't function properly. They're kept alive by respirators and machines and medicines that keep their heart going, but to deteriorate everything else in the body. So it's kind of like, what, what kind of life is that? You know, you got to really kind of think about what quality of life you're experiencing while you're here. And I've seen a number of people that I just don't think are really experiencing life at all. And, um, Technically, that to me, that's not really alive. That's just kind of like a <laughs> that's flatlining through life, you know. Exactly, and of course, the the big goal in life now is to make money. And I I have friends, uh, you know, right at this moment are saying, "Oh, the stock market's up, and and they're making a killing," and and uh, all that's going to go away. It's it's fake, and it's 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 being taken away from us for a reason. People don't realize it yet, but, you know, this whole scam about a pandemic is actually to cover for, amongst other things, you know, an economy that was designed to fail a long time ago. So now they have something to blame it on so that they aren't culpable. And right until the end, people are, uh, you know, worried about making money. And, you know, and I tell friends, they're saying, oh, geez, you know, the ones that aren't doing so well, they've lost their job. I'm saying, Hey, we're all in the same boat, you know, (laughs) this whole thing's gone down. So just, this is a time, you know, wake up, enjoy yourself, you know, use it as an opportunity. And I see what's going on now, not as a crisis at all, just, uh, you know, the way you relate, because I see more people questioning life now. I see more people waking up to truths and realizing that we've all been lied to. So it's, uh, I think there's great opportunity here. Yeah, me too. I really think that that's the biggest positive that's come out of this whole thing is more, you know, how many people knew about terrain theory a few months ago? You know, like you guys said earlier, it's just, there's not many people that really, when you talk to people, they don't really get that. They don't, it's something completely new to them, but now millions more people know about terrain theory and the way, you know, the nature of viruses and, and uh, the way that the body handles or creates or is immune to depending on the situation you know, the, uh, the ailments that where a lot of people are scared of, but then I guess people like us, you know, I think you guys would agree. None of us have any fear whatsoever of illness or disease because we know, we know that we have full responsibility over, uh, how we function. You know, It's not something that we just, we go about our lives and then out of happenstance or chance, we just fall ill or we were attacked by a virus or a bacteria or something. We know that that doesn't happen. So we know that we, by taking care of ourselves, we, we watch what we eat, we watch what we drink, we watch how we sleep and how we move through life. So we have a, very, we have a real comfortability and there's no, there's no fear at all. Whereas the average person still has that sense of fear because they, they have not taken responsibility for themselves yet. And so therefore, they assume that we are protected by outside forces by medicines, by governments, by whoever else, doctors. So in, in that mindset, that's a, very, that's a very scary mindset to have to live in because you are powerless. You're, every single element of your safety and security in life comes from something outside of you. It comes from authoritarian bodies. It comes from doctors. It comes from medicines that you've never questioned. It comes from money. You know, whereas people like us, we find safety and security and comfort in ourselves and the people around us and in, in the nature that we're surrounded by. Yeah. And, and we also know we're not our bodies, we're an eternal consciousness. And the, these systems that uh, sell us security are constantly doing it by making us afraid of uh, losing our bodies. So the fear yeah. of death, of course, underlies everything. And uh, you know, I don't say it to people, but, you know, sometimes in the past when I was practicing, people would come in and, 
And uh, they say, well, the, what's the worst thing that could happen, doc? You know, and I'm like, well, I'm thinking to myself, well, you could die. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's just a, a journey. It's, uh, you know, wandering on the other side of the veil and life goes on. And, but, you know, we're never, uh, when you're in nature, you, you see that, you know, you see those energetics, the patterns that create everything. And you just realize you're part of something much larger than just your body. So, of course, science and uh, medicine and our technologies are all shielding us from that realization and brought us into this mechanistic uh, view of the world, including our own bodies, and to the point of thinking that's who we are in the first place. Yeah, the, the law of correspondence is in big time play here because we've been at perpetual war for a long time now. I mean, we, the whole 20th century was perpetual war. Um, we, our, our, our basically, our, most of our governments are in perpetual crisis war. Um, and so our bodies, they tell us, are in perpetual war against germs. And this puts us all on the defense that, um, you know, we're, uh, that we have to protect ourselves, defend ourselves from everything. And, and so it's, we're in this parasympathetic mode of constant crisis mode. And uh, it's by design. And uh, it's just really interesting what you say, Tom, in terms of the empowering notion of self uh discipline and the idea of taking care of yourself uh, really is freeing. And while that could be scary to a lot of people, um, yeah, living in this perpetual state of war as they have, uh, where you're looking for someone to defend you and someone to help you all the time, um, that's, that's not a way to live at all. So it, you know, what we're all about solutions here. And we, we stress this all the time. Like we've done shows on fasting shows on breathing. There's so many things you can do that are free that are capable for everybody to achieve and to access for your health that will empower you. Um, so, you know, that being said, um, what are some things that you do for your health, Tom, and, um, you know, and uh, that you're into and uh, knowing what you know, and give us a little breakdown of kind of your vision of health and what you do and uh, what you're all about. Yeah, sure. So uh, I guess just following on from what you just said, uh, that I let go of that war mentality about 15 years ago, 20 years ago now, uh, where prior to that, if I had, they'll say, uh, I had um, tinea, like tone, uh, toe fungus, or I had a virus or something, the mentality was still kill it. You know, I got to kill it. I got something in me or on <laughs> yeah. me, I got to kill it. And it's like, that's, that's a warm, a real war mentality. Like you said, Mike, we're just kind of uh, indoctrinated with a war mentality with a lot of things. And then once I let go of that and I realized that some of these things are really there to perform a function and they're actually there to help, more than they are to invade, then the mindset completely changes. So instead of having that war mentality, you have that kind of cooperative mentality where everything's going to the, a, a greater place together. And then that, men, that mental shift alone alleviates stress and energy straight away. Your energy goes up. Letting go of a war mentality of having to fight things inside of yourself, uh, which is a you know representation of fighting things outside of yourself. So. That was one thing um, that I did a long time ago, which freed up a lot of energy for myself. Just lifestyle wise, like you said, most things that we can do are free. The last things I'll talk about, I guess, are the ones that cost a bit more money, but the free stuff um, I like to do. I mean, I live in Byron Bay. doesn't get really super cold here, does it? Night, you know, in the winter, it's getting into winter now. Um, but I love having cold showers. I love cold water immersion. So I'll go to the rock pools or I've got a rainwater tank at home and the water's quite cold. I like to shower and bathe in cold water. It's very healthy, very healing for me. Uh, the other thing that I like to get a lot of is sun. So we're told in Australia, don't get more than you know, a small amount of sun because we're the skin cancer capital of the world and everything else. And while that might be true, I think people misunderstand the reasons for that and that it's actually, there's a lot of deficiencies that lead to the rates of skin cancer we have here, such as people spending too much time out of the sun and getting vitamin D deficiencies, which can then lead to other issues in the body, which creates the cancers that the sun is just a catalyst for. It doesn't, it doesn't cause them. Um, the, the nutritional deficiencies, the putting of all this stuff on the skin that most people have never looked into what that is. So if you look on anything that you put on your skin, it probably comes in a bottle or a tube or a tub. Look on that and look at the huge list of things that that's made of. You know, most of that stuff you probably can't even pronounce. 
which means you definitely don't, don't know what it is or what it does. But <laughs> yeah. the thing is that if you looked into those things, you would find that they break down the protective mechanisms of cells. So that's your skin. You're essentially breaking down what is your natural protective mechanism where your skin produces oils. You have, when you have stronger cell membranes too, they're not as easy to damage, which means the sun doesn't damage them as easily. Um, so for me, I like to get as much sun as possible on my entire body, which means that the right beaches around here you can go to or my place at home where there's no one around, I'll get sun on my entire body. If I can get sun on every single part of my body, I feel honestly 10% more effective and better and more vibrant that day than if I haven't managed to get sun on the entirety of my body, which also includes the gonads, which can actually help to increase levels of testosterone naturally. Like most of our body is meant to see the sun. It's just our Western culture that is decided we need to cover everything up. So that includes, as I said, every part of your body. Um, I spend a lot of time observing as much as possible. So myself and the world around me, I've learned a lot more from observing the nature of animals and trees and plants and the way the wind moves, the way clouds move. I've learned more from doing that than I have from books. And especially by learning to observe myself watching these things. So that's how I've learned a lot more about who I am and how I function. Uh, it doesn't mean everybody has to do that, but that's just something that I've, I've found has been as somebody who is very driven um, from, you know, we all kind of, we all come into the world with our own nature, but also by our upbringing and how we're kind of conditioned to receive, uh, you know, your um, approval and things from your parents and those around you, you kind of learn to be a certain way. And I learned to seek approval in certain ways and really strive. So I've always been very driven. I think I have that nature anyway, but upbringing didn't help. So uh, my ability to be able to observe what I'm doing has meant that I'm not making all the silly decisions that I made previously, which were very unhealthy. I would injure myself a lot. I would do a lot of things that weren't good for my physical body or my mental or spiritual body. Whereas these days I've got a much better handle on that. And that came really from that ability to start observing myself and what I'm doing. And I like to move, you know, we all have different bodies. We all have different natures. I'm definitely one of those people that's designed to do physical work. Um, that got taken away from me when I got really sick with chronic fatigue and mercury toxicity and adrenal fatigue, which were all kind of combined as one thing. But at the same time, you know, every, having been through that, I've helped a lot of other people who have got into that seriously, uh, non-functioning state and none of them want to move but it's important to know that no matter what your state of health your body as a biological unit is designed to move we have biological pumps in the body that can only function when we have compression expansion and everything else going on within the body so what i learned through my periods of ill health was how to move in a way that gave energy as opposed to depleting energy so if you go out for a big run or you work yourself into the ground or you do heavy gardening, that can deplete the body. But if you learn how to work in and work with the body and work with the breath, you can cultivate energy in the body through movement, more so than sitting still. A lot of people, when they get tired, they just want to sit completely still. There's a time and a place for that. But for prolong if that goes on for a long period of time, your energy will continue to go down. We need to bolster our uh, every system in the body through movement. And it just means being a bit smarter about how you move. But for anyone that's interested in learning more about that, I learned most of that stuff from Paul Check. Uh, he teaches a lot about working in to complement working out. It's based on Tai Chi and Qi Gong and the, um, you know, all the ancient energy uh, uh, arts, I guess you'd call them. And just learning how to work with the body. So, yeah, that's kind of like... Yeah, those are great stuff. points. Yeah, great points. Um... I spent a long time in, you know, typical sports and it was all about working harder and beating yourself up. And it wasn't until I got into the internal martial arts that you learn how to do exactly what you're talking about. And uh, in the long run, you find not only are you not getting injured, but you're actually restoring your body from old injuries. And, uh, you know, at the, at the end of every workout, you feel refreshed rather than drained. And, and then some of the other things you mentioned, you know, you take a cold shower, jump in the river after, and, and uh, it, it's, it's a whole different mindset. And uh, in, also in, in Western sports, we're taught to really uh, get our emotions jacked up. You know, I used to play football. So, you know, it's all about, you know, just getting yourself worked up and, 
and uh, you know, just going insane, and you know, you you make yourself exhausted just by having your emotions run wild. Then you go back into the internal heart uh, arts, and it's all about the opposite. It's about channeling that energy, not leaking energy by you know emoting excessively, and uh, yeah, just a whole different thing. So I love your message, and uh, so you want to get into some of the other methods uh, that aren't free. Yeah, sure. Well, um, you know, just on that point that you made, I think it's funny when you look at the way people play sports in places like Fiji, like not the more developed places, but the places that are still, everybody plays, everybody wrestles, everybody th throws things to each other and creates games out of it. But there's no money involved in it. There's no big sponsorship deals and careers. So the way they play sport is very different from the way we play sport in the West. So we have this stress and money and the, like you said, the emotion attached to it. And there's somewhat the, you play it because you enjoy the sport, but there's a lot of the enjoyment and the joy is taken out with the money and the stress and the emotion that's put into it. Whereas you see the way other people play sport in other countries that don't have the monetary attachment. And it's a lot more invigorating because it's for the joy of the sport. You know, um, the other things I do actually, I didn't mention is, uh, you know, a lot of people, I guess, are familiar with grounding. It's just having your, your bare feet, your bare hands, whatever, touching things like trees, having your feet in the soil, allowing the uh you know the charges in your body to balance out with with the earth because a lot of people spend they wake up they put on synthetic socks they walk around on uh, tiles or floorboards that is synthetic they get in the car they wear rubber soled shoes they never ground themselves with the earth because we we are electrical beings the earth has an electrical charge and you know everything balances itself itself out naturally you don't even have to know this stuff but you it's just that whole grounding effect you know how much of your body is being in contact with nature at any one time. Um, you know, I, I know I'm really lucky to live where I live because I get to do that every day. I know other people, whether consciously or unconsciously, have chosen to live in places with very little um, access to nature. There's a lot of concrete, there's a lot of just synthetic stuff and they don't have that, that uh, connection. So uh, I understand that, but everybody can still make some effort to, to have that grounding effect. So the things that kind of cost a bit more money, one of the things I like to do is have uh, lymphatic baths. They're very helpful for me and anybody that's dealt with chronic toxicity and um, environmental toxins. And that's having a bath from getting up to 45 minutes if possible to an hour. Um, but that's with water that's heated to 39 to 41 degrees Celsius. I'm not sure what that is in Fahrenheit. I think it's just over 100, 101, I think maybe. What that does is if you can sit in that for that length of time, it helps to dissolve some of the plastics and the residues that are in the body and it it helps to drain the lymphatic system. So that's very helpful for people like me who had gone through chronic toxicity through environmental toxins and vaccines. Um, but you know, you have to be able to pay your heating bills and all that sort of stuff and have mm -hmm. access to good quality water like rainwater. Um, and then your organic food. So since I was 25, I think I've just not eaten anything other than organic food. So that's just making sure that a, the food has, far more nutritive value and energetic value in the food because essentially we can only build our cells from the nutrition that we get. So the quality of what we put in our body determines the quality of what we build ourselves with. So organic food is very important um, to me. Uh, every client I ever worked with, my aim was to get them onto organic food. So if that was somebody without a budget to play with, I would look at their... Um, I would look at how much money they bought in and how much they were spending. And quite often they could afford organic food. They just didn't because they liked Netflix and they liked their, uh, you know, other stuff that they do going to the movies three times a week and eating, eating out twice a week, all things that aren't necessary. I'm not saying they're wrong to do, but it's just, we have to make decisions. I decided when I was young that any money that I earned, I wanted to use to help me experience life to its fullest. For some people that is eating out and going to the movies, that's fine. For me, it's having the best vehicle that I have through which my spirit can, I guess, enjoy this physical life that we experience. So for me, that means I spend all of my money on clean foods and water and making sure that if I need to put anything on my skin, it's an organic oil. It's not a synthetic thing that comes out of from a company. It's not mass produced. Um, things that cost more, but at the end of the day, give us more in return. The other thing about organic foods is that we're already exposed to so much toxicity in the world through the air, the, the water, the food supply, it's, it's like inescapable, but 
that also doesn't bother me because I know that we're very resilient and we have ways to deal with that. And especially if we help ourselves deal with that, such as not putting extra undue toxins in, um, you know, if people had any idea of the amount of chemical sprays and things that go on the typical food that they consume, um, then they get an idea as to why a lot of the world is tired, sick, overweight, malnourished and, uh, and everything else that goes along with that. So organic food to me and, um, and natural sources of food and water are super important. If, you're, if you want to live to your optimal state of being, then that's an important thing to do. Um, as far as the money goes, I think that's really, re really where it is. You know, when I was working with people, I would, I've worked with people who made stupid amounts of money, like really, really excessive amounts of money, more than you need. And they would not buy organic food. Something in their mind stopped <laughs> them spending. They could easily afford it, but it was just something. There was a mentality about in their mind, food costs this much and that's all I'm spending. And the rest goes on holidays and their, their European cars and whatever else. But they wouldn't, they refuse to spend it on organic food. Uh, still can't explain that one. And then the other side of the coin with the people who uh, I couldn't even afford to pay me for a consult and couldn't really afford organic food. So what I would do is, again, I would go through their um, income and, and expenditures, take out anything. If they weren't willing to drop those things that weren't really necessary in order to heal, I didn't work with them because obviously they weren't committed to helping themselves get better. But then in a lot of cases, I actually didn't charge a consultation fee, I would say that in order for them to be able to afford food, once we went through their, their, um, you know, their financials, we made it so that they spent that money on organic food and they would pay me by bringing me a meal, for example. So that in that way, they would learn how to source, prepare and make a nutritious meal for, them, for me. But in doing that, they were learning how to do it for themselves. So then that kind of bought money because I've I've tried as much as I can to live without money for the, a long time. I've gone several periods living in the bush, just sticking a tent in the bush down by the beach and living there and, you know, uh, living on as little money as possible because I, I don't like the whole monetary system. You know, as you guys kind of spoke about earlier, this has been a good time for people to reassess what's important. But uh, yeah, I don't yeah. know. I can keep going with other things. Just you guys throw it out there. Well, no, I think you make an important point too. You mentioned that the body's electric and, um, you know, of course it all emanates from our minds in the first place. And, uh, in my experience, I'd see people in clinic that, um, were purist and I really believe that everything you're talking about and, and, and like to enjoy that lifestyle myself, eating organic food, taking care of myself, exercise, but I'd see people that were uh, purist and so obsessed with detoxifying and worried about toxins that mm. they were, became the most toxic people I'd see <laughs> and the hardest clinical cases to manage. And then they'd always make comments and say, well, I know so-and-so, they're healthy, they don't have all the problems I have, and they, you know, they're not as discriminating about their diet and everything. So it's a, it's a, it's a delicate balance. You know, I tell people that, you know, you eat organic food because it tastes good. It just feels better. You exercise because it's fun. You know, I think innately, if we're in good shape, we just naturally like to run, jump, and play. So it's, it's about the enjoyment factor. But I think even in the health movement these days, it's become this obsession with, I don't want to get sick. So we, we end up being in the same old conventional box because we're doing these things to prevent illness you know, uh, and it's something that doesn't even exist in the first place. So, so I always try to stress, you know, do it for the fun of it. Uh, you know, do it to expand your awareness and, to, you know, open your horizons, not because you're afraid of something all over again, because you're not going to be healthy, uh, no matter how much organic food that you eat, if, uh, if you're afraid, and then all those toxins that we're all exposed to, I think in the right kind of mindset, that's uh, in the absence of fear, those things are just going to move right through you. You aren't going to, you know, become a magnet and just, uh, you know, attract all that stuff to you and, and hold on to it. Yeah, absolutely. 100% agree. I've seen so many people make themselves sick, had nothing wrong with them, then find out about some new diet that depletes every kind of food group in the world, almost except for one or find out that they're supposed to drink 20 liters of water a week a day. <laughs> and I've seen people who are otherwise healthy make themselves sick by buying into health routines. And I totally agree. 
I deal with people. That's what I do when I deal with people as well. I make sure that what place are they coming from in the decisions that they make? Is it because they are doing it for, you know, is it a joyful thing? Is it something that is they're choosing because it brings joy and it comes from a place of positivity or is it coming from that place of fear? And as you said, you know, it's like a, an example of that is when somebody eats a certain food, let's say it's uh, people have convinced themselves a certain foods are bad for them. Right. But let's say that food is really good for them then putting them in their mouth and they, they're convinced that that's a poison, the chemical reaction that goes on and the hormones they produce are stress and toxic hormones, which essentially turns that into a, a food that was good and can completely deplete the value of that food. And I totally agree. There's so many people talking about 5G and, um, and a lot of other things coming in. And while it's certainly not, not good, it's, I've spoken about this in other interviews. The reason that I'm not scared of it is because I think really think that when we carry the right personal resonance, it counteracts, like you said, the toxins, the, the uh, EMFs that we're exposed to. I don't go out of my way to expose myself to them, but I'm not scared of them. So in that respect, somebody with that state of being is going to be a lot healthier in any world and in any situation than somebody that is, feels that they are being oppressed by what's outside of them. Yeah, that's a, uh, that's amazing point. And real quick on the, and I want to touch into that and 5G. And it's funny, our last guest, we were talking a lot about 5G and I ended it by saying, well, if we could just be Qigong masters, it wouldn't matter because we could just control the frequencies ourselves, see them and go, oh, get out of here. And I'm, you know, you're like in the matrix, just controlling the code and transmuting in real time. You know, if you, it's, this is what the reality is all about. But real quick on the lymphatic stuff, because you had a, really interesting story about the chronic fatigue and everything you did in the bath stuff I love to do, but also if people can't afford, you know, these, these, um, going to these clinics and stuff, uh, Kundalini yoga has a, a ton of wonderful, uh, things you can do as far as cleansing out your lymphatic system, which is breath work and, um, different, uh, Kundalini yoga, act, uh, activities, uh, that I've been doing. I got into it pretty big about six, seven months ago, uh, because I was kind of going through some of this stuff and it's just been amazing. So I don't know if you, if you do any of that, but for those listening, um, look into Kundalini yoga too, because, uh, it's got a big focus on the lymphatic system and, and cleansing it out with, you know, and that's once again, another free thing you can do. Um, but yeah, Tom, um, that's really inspiring what you just said about 5g, cause I know it's the 5g apocalypse and everything that everyone's covering. And it's a very, very important topic. And, and I, I'm more concerned about 5G, not so much on the health aspect, but more on the control grid kind of technocracy aspect of and transhumanistic kind of um, path that seems like West that scientism and the and in the technocracy is pushing towards, which is very anti-human, anti-nature. And as you mentioned, Steiner earlier, as Steiner warned us about, you know, 100 years ago, uh, that I am more concerned about than necessarily the health you know, effects, but also that does really real as well. And I would love to hear more on your perspective. And I know Bear would love to chime in too, in, in terms of what you guys are dealing with right now, where you are in Australia and um, that relating to vaccines, 5G, or these are all like the buzzwords that'll get us kicked off YouTube and stuff. <laughs> but um, yeah, what, what's kind of going on there in your climate there? And um, I would really love to hear more of your perspective on that because that's, um, it's really refreshing. Okay, so a lot of people in Australia, you know, I think there's still uh, the majority of people think that 5G is a good idea. They think that everything that is being offered, um, okay, what I'll do, I'll preface this with, uh, with something else. So uh, when I teach people about our rights as humans, not humans, but men and women, there's, a, there's two distinct uh, realms that essentially the law is based around. One is the public and one is the private. So they're, they're mirror images of each other. In the public, it, there's men and women. There's, we have inherent rights that can't be taken away. Um, we only really follow two laws, which is love thy neighbor. It doesn't matter if people think the Bible is great or not. It doesn't matter because that's just what law is based on. And that's what gives us... Uh, uh, Tom, you, you broke up for a second. If you could, just for those listening, if you could rewind back to the, um, the, what you were saying about the only real laws, love thy, I think you were saying love thy neighbor. Yep. You take it from there. Love thy neighbor and love thy creator. Okay. And um, so, yeah, so uh, I was just saying that it doesn't matter whether you think that there's a creator or that the Bible's great or it's crap or whatever. It doesn't matter. 
because our laws are based on that and that's what gives us our rights. That's what gives us our inherent rights. Uh, on the other side of the coin, you have the realm of the public. The public is the realm of persons, citizens, ratepayers, taxpayers, all that sort of stuff. They're the opposite of men and women. Men and women are alive. The realm of the private is living. The realm of the public is dead. That's where entities exist. And that's where statutes and acts and codes and laws and legislations all apply. Um, there's also, instead of love thy neighbor, love thy creator, you have 20 million plus statutes that you're supposed to abide by. And instead of rights, where we're born with rights that can't be taken away in the world of the private, the opposite of that is in the world of the public, instead of having rights, you have benefits and privileges. So the reason I bring that up is that people are conditioned. The Matrix movie did a great job of painting this picture where people are so heavily indoctrinated by and reliant on the system that they want, the, they want their benefits and privileges. They associate that with their security and safety in life. Whereas people who become self-realized want the responsibility of being their own safety and security and they want their inherent rights. They don't want the benefits and privileges or they can go with them or without them is I guess the point. So the point of that little preface is that everything that's being offered is a benefit and a privilege and they come through the form of convenience. People think it will be great to have self-drive cars because they don't have to drive a car themselves. People think it's great that we're being monitored because they're scared of uh, terrorists or bad people who are going to, who are out to hurt them or take something from them. So they think having a smart network is a great idea. The less they have to do for themselves, the better because they, they live in that world of convenience. But you know, anybody that's gone outside of that knows that convenience kills. Convenience means using microwaves and depleting your, your nutrition. Convenience means not walking around as much as we're designed to walk and having problems like back pain and, and weak legs and knees and, weight gain and depression and all that that comes from inactivity. So convenience in most cases actually depletes who we are and what we're supposed to be doing. Some parts of technology have probably uh, made life better in some ways, but I don't associate comfort with better. I, I, when I find that I get too comfortable, I've lived in a house for a little bit too long. I go out and live in a tent in the bush. And I do that for months until I feel I'm connected again. And I don't feel comfortable because comfortable to me is not, alive comfortable is not fun it doesn't make me it doesn't allow me to learn more about myself it doesn't allow me to grow so i constantly seek to uh you know and i'm a comfortable guy it's not like i'm uncomfortable that's the thing too it's just uh you know <laughs> anyway that's something else we can talk about but uh people seem to want what 5g and smart ne networks will bring they think it'll bring us closer together they think life will be easier people just seem to want this whole easier 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 life that's what's sold to us it's an ideal and it's a, it's a fake ideal. It's a fantasy, an easy life. There is nothing, nothing of value ever comes from something that's easy. Everything for me, like surfing, you know, that's probably my favorite thing to do in the world. But you have to work at that. You can't just pick up a board, paddle into a wave, pull into a 10 second tube and get spat out and flick off the back and just go, well, that was all right. You can't do that. You have to be, you have to go over the falls 50 times. You have to have the experience of not even being able to paddle it out because you're getting pumped. You can't even get through the waves. Your shoulders are too tired because you're not conditioned to paddle a board. It takes, it's a reward. You have to go through a lot of beatings, a lot of um, wearing yourself out, a lot of mistakes to even be able to get to the spot where you can get a good wave and to be amongst the people that are that, you know, you have to earn that. And it is so rewarding because you earn it. You're not given that. Um, I love music too. I love playing, I play various instruments. And that gives me great joy. And it gives me great joy because I have to work hard at it. It's something that you can't, there's that whole mastery thing of 10,000 hours in anything. And for, to master something has also shown probably some form of self mastery because you have to have had the discipline to stick at it and no one can take that away from you ever. So that's where I find for myself, the value and the joy and everything comes in life. It's not from something that's easier. Anything that becomes easier for me is not, not fun. You know, it's not rewarding. So. Um, I guess I went on too long with that, but that's what the whole thing. The whole reason that people seem to want 5g and smart networks is because they think life will be easier and they equate easier with better. And that's just where they are. That's fine. That's, that's their decisions. The other side of the coin is we have, especially in the Byron Shire that I live in Byron Bay, Mullumbimby, we have a lot of people that are activists that came to this area because it's an area of healing and they know what this sort of stuff is about. And we don't want that. So a lot of people here are more than willing to go and burn the towers down if they go up. You know, there's a lot of people that won't let this stuff go into this particular area. 
Um, so there's, um, yeah, I mean, the health aspects we can talk about, but I think the main issue, as you, as you said, Mike, is the, uh, this smart network, smart cars, um, smart cities. Uh, if you do anything wrong, it doesn't matter about being given a fine anymore. It just comes out of your bank account, which is the only thing you have because there's no cash anymore. So it's all social credits and everything can be taken away. If you say one bad thing about the government, as a lot of comedians have said for 10 years or more, Bill Burr is one of my favorite comedians. He has that bit about being microchipped and there's some guy <laughs> waving at the sky. So I turn my chip back on because he said one bad word about government. They turned it off and he's, he's screwed now. So, you know, that's, that's not a so, fantasy future. So Tom, since you opened the door, uh, distinguishing between statutes and natural law, do you think there's any value uh, in filing paperwork and making that distinction and noticing the, the corporate uh, world there that we think of as government uh, and just to notice them that no, we're sentient beings and not a dead piece of paper? I think, yeah, there's, there's two answers to that. One is that at the end of the day, it's going to be, it's going to take a great amount of people to do that, to make that have a great effect. I think um, like anything, this area of law and rights and natural law requires work. It's not something that you can learn just to file a few notices and that's going to get, that's your get out of jail free card because what's going to happen is that if not enough people do it, or if you receive something in return, and you don't know how law works, which takes time to learn, um, it's not really going to go anywhere for you. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna uh, <laughs> discourage people from doing it because I think it's better to do it than not, to file your notices of non-consent, I really do. But um, you, know, you have to learn what's called holding your position. And that's understanding what happens when somebody does or doesn't do something on the other end, how that works in commerce. So um, an example being that, um, you know, I paid a few utility bills with my birth certificate and then filing, like creating my own financial instrument to pay the bill. The reason you can do that is there's no such thing as money since every, the world's governments became insolvent and we're dealing directly with uh, the world, you know, the statutory world, which means that there's no debt anymore. There's only a liability to pay a debt. So you can discharge a liability, discharge meaning to move to a future date with a promissory note or you can discharge that liability by accessing the credits that you have in treasury. It's the same in the United States as it is in Commonwealth countries where you have credits in treasury that were created when you were born. That's why you have a birth certificate made out in your name. And, uh, and you, you've got a social security or a Centrelink number or whatever it is in your country. You're just not taught how to use that. You're not meant to know how to use it, but that's set up. So I got letters back from the gas company saying, we don't accept that form of payment. But if, so somebody who's just sent that in was, God damn it, that didn't work. They'll send in their own fiat currency and pay it with that. But they actually said in that notice they sent back to me that they've accepted it because they said, we don't accept that form of payment. But what they've said is I've paid them. I've presented payment. I don't care if they don't accept it. That's the same as me owing you $100, offering you a $100 note and you go, I don't accept that form of payment. Well, then there's no debt and I don't have a liability to give you $100 anymore. You've just said you don't accept that payment. There's no liability to pay a debt. But if you don't know that, so that just went away. That gas bill went away because I paid it. I discharged the liability to pay the debt. But somebody that doesn't know how to read between the lines and what they get back, they'll think, damn it, it didn't work. And it's the same with your notices of non-consent. If you don't understand that they will accept by assent if they don't respond and reply and that you can go to a registrar at any court with three unanswered notices and an affidavit in support an affidavit stands as the truth in court an unrebutted affidavit. You can, you don't even have to go to court. You can go to a registrar at a court and they'll give you uh, essentially a court order, a document saying that you are now not liable for, you don't have to get vaccines. You don't have to get, you don't have to be uh, locked down. You don't have to be restricted from travel, but that's a lot of work for, my, that's three years of uh, learning the law for me to know how to do that. That didn't come in a week or a year or two years, it gave me three years, you know? So, um, yeah, to, I mean, just years I ago. Still... Go ahead. No, I was just going to say years ago, we started doing those processes a long time ago. You know, we'd monetize our birth certificate by creating a bond with it and, you know, list on the, on the face of the bond, all the things that you want to discharge. And it was interesting because uh, back then it wasn't 
a well-known technique like it is now. You can read about it on the internet in a lot of places. And uh, we had a lot of responses that were more favorable because the people that you're horse trading with just uh, realized that, oh, this person actually knows what's going on and they'd be a lot more straightforward. We go into car dealerships, banks, and, and uh, you know, just have an intelligent conversation and a meeting of the minds and everything would go away. But when it started becoming more popular, um, you know, that's where we, we notice people start having a, a more uh, on the other side, you know, on the, uh, on the corporate side of the commerce, you know, that's where they became a lot more resistant because they thought, uh Oh, you know, people are starting to wake up. But, um, you know, our last interview we had, uh, we were talking about some similar things. And I was saying that it's very common these days too for people to learn a little bit of the paper process and believe that the power was in the paper. And what I said was, no, the power's not in the paper. It's about your intention behind the power. So yeah, it, it, you really need to know how it works and you have to know how to enforce it, but realize that your paperwork, it's not about that you see a lot of people quibbling. Well, we, the process should go this way or, you know, they'll get really caught up in technicalities. It's like, no, that, that's not it at all. It's, it's very simple. And, you know, you, if you want to be a creditor instead of a debtor, it's a matter of just noticing the other party of your position that you're not going to bend and this is just the way it is. So you can write something on a, on a napkin, I think, and if you have the right intention and the right knowledge behind it, you're going to be more successful than all the more, uh, you know, elaborate paperwork in the world. Yeah. And also it's your, it's who you are, as you said. I mean, I, I say with these things too, it's do or die. You can't go into this sort of stuff half cocked and expect to win because you're dealing against the behemoth of the system. You know, you, you're not, it's, it's not something you can just easily brush aside. You have to be willing to go all the way if you're going to do anything at all. And more than anything, it's, it's about, it's about removing all the levels of fear that people have in themselves uh, as they've entered the world and they've been indoctrinated with different ideas and ideals. The example I always give, especially if you're dealing with any government official or police officer or whatever, is that it's not about learning the things to say, the questions, you know, uh, you know, do you have evidence for that or what's your source of authority or whatever. It's not about what you speak, it's about who you are because they're trained in this. They're not just going to go, oh, you've asked me the right question. Have a nice day. See you later. Sorry to bother you. They're not going to do that. They're going to test you and make sure you really know what, who you are. And it's the, the example I always give is that two people can walk down a dark alleyway. There's a Rottweiler down the other end and one person it'll lick and the other it'll bark its head off at. And it's because of, it doesn't matter if you know logically that Rottweilers can be friendly or that you are, you know, it doesn't matter what you know logically, it's who you are and what you resonate into the world that determines the success that you will have in standing for your own rights and that in itself is good because that doesn't come easily which means it's hugely rewarding so that when you get to the stage where you can stick up for your own rights and you can defend yourself in a variety of ways it's because now you know that you're a free being on a lot of levels as opposed to it being easy and you learn a few lines to say, or you just sign a notice and send it off and then bang, it goes away. You know, again, going back to what we we're talking about with, um, you know, convenience and ease and life being easy, it's not meant to be like that. So you never know if it's like a, if a martial arts school just gave out black belts and you were never tested, what, what is that black belt worth? It's just, it's a false sense of anytime you actually have to test yourself or be tested, you don't actually know you're, you're still a scared kid walking around just you've got a black belt to walk around with but you're still a scared kid as opposed to the person who doesn't need a belt or anything else they go through the training and they go through the experience and they go through testing themselves and you come out the other end comfortable and confident and um and empowered you know it's not based on um you know it, it wasn't something that was given to you and nobody can take that away as i said before because it only came to you through that experience and through the work and uh and that's I guess that's the best way I can explain the whole, yeah. um, the natural law thing. Yeah. So because I think you have to work at it. You're talking about the TDA accounts, like with the, uh, when, so there's people in the chat, you know, this always gets fired up when this, this, uh, topic comes up because there's a lot of, you know, misinformation and, and a lot of 
people out there on the internet too that are selling services now to access this, which gets a little yeah. weird. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I was waking up to this, God, a decade ago. And actually, Bear was pretty instrumental in waking me up to this. And I started researching it. And this goes back to, I, I'm, I'm really into researching history and stuff. You know, the Act of 1666, if you're familiar with this, which goes all the way back. This is, um, you know, English law which is as a commonwealth country and even the United States, we're still affected by in most of the world actually. Uh, but the act of 1666, I always say it wrong. It's the Sestui K V or something like that. But essentially it's this maritime law. Sescave trust. Say again, Bear, sorry. Sescave. Sescave, yeah. It's, it's C-E-S-T uh, then Q. I, I'd have to look at it, but yeah. It's, it's a trust that's created by our birth certificate. Exactly. And so the idea is that we're all lost at sea uh, when we're born and given the certificate. And uh, essentially, this actually had some historical reasons for it, because back in 1666, there were a lot of people lost at sea, as that was the big time of, you know, of exploration. And so the state said, what are we going to do with, uh, you know, these people's uh, estates? when uh, if they're lost at sea so they developed this and they just basically manipulated it for all um all the um the folks back then and then that was been carried over to through the english empire and into the states and now throughout the whole world and um every time i bring this up to people i mean this is a big triggering thing for a lot but look it up this is it's a history i mean and then you have the act of 18 in 1871 the united states basically became an official incorporated entity and it's why it's all in the caps united states of america and so what they've done is they've taken that what you're talking about public versus private and they privatized all the countries are all corporations um we're dealing with uh, corporate entities and but we are not us we are it's our straw man that they create when we're born that is our own dead kind of um, asset that they use. Uh, so anyways, this is a big topic and it's really cool you know about this, Tom, because a lot of people don't. Um, and so just, it's, uh, go ahead, Bear, but sorry, I, I'm just, just gonna just say that's fascinating. Quick clarific okay, uh -huh. go ahead, Bear, go ahead. Well, just a clarification, it's uh, Sestui-K and that's spelled C-E-S-T-U-I and then separate Q-U-E. Um, I've seen that a thousand times. I should not have spelled by now. So in, anyway, and then uh, then there's a, a third part of it, V I E, but um, but it's a trust. It's created. I was just going to say real quick in passing, Tom, that I think a lot of the problems that I've seen in this whole movement with the paperwork is that it became about money. A lot of uh, gurus out there started selling paperwork and methods in order to cash in. So I saw all these people doing this and saying, oh, I'm gonna make a billion dollars off my birth certificate. And, and you know, where, and so again, you're back in the same mindset, you're trying to, uh, you know, leave. You're, what it's really about is, uh, you know, taking back our freedom and, and, and not about making money. And, you know, a guy that really helped me take it to the next level, and this is quite a few years ago, I was brought into uh, some private circles, and there was a gentleman, um, uh, David Wynn Miller, that um, brought in uh, a deeper understanding of the language, uh, you know, behind everything. And a lot of light bulbs really came on because he had a way of quantifying language, and you're probably aware of this guy. But um, basically, anything that is in, in present time especially paperwork that we get summonsed with and you know the stuff we're getting served with in these contracts all the time it's all past and future tense which makes it fiction it's fake so with uh the paperwork or, or the game that we learned was how to you know create uh legal processes that were all present time and you know every sentence had to be constructed like a an equation so they balanced each other out which you could you know test the veracity of anything you were saying or anything that somebody else was presenting you with and it would actually hold up in court and you could show that something was fiction on its face by the very fact that it wasn't even in present time uh have you had any experience with that yeah so uh essentially you know like mike said we're, we're assumed dead because we're assumed lost at sea 
we're also assumed to be incompetent because we babble. We don't understand the language that we speak. So when we speak in English, the, the, what we think is the meaning is probably the opposite of the legal meaning. So we incriminate ourselves a lot and we don't, we babble. We're, we're just assumed to be incompetent, lost at sea and everything else. Unless we step up as a creditor and show that we're not incompetent, we're not dead. <laughs> uh, also that realm of fiction and, um, uh, sorry, the realm of the public and private, the realm of the public is the realm of fiction, fictional money, fictional uh, entities. The realm of the private is the world of substance, living man and woman, soul, flesh and blood, that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, so with the wording, uh, definitely, there's, there's definitely a code within, like English is the last language created by the legal profession, which I think was about a thousand years ago. And um, it's the most controlled, coded language that there is. You know, our language is just, really bad <laughs> compared to language that are a lot older. Um, they, they carry a lot more meaning and a lot more uh, just meaning in, in the language. So uh, for me, what I've found is the most important thing is to not mix jurisdictions. So what happens is you're right. A lot of people have kind of sold this thing out and I have a feeling it might even be as people cotton onto it. I think the legal profession started creating the, some of these gurus to lead people astray like give them half the story, but lead them astray. So they go, oh, we can protect our rights. Well, this is awesome. I'll just do this. I'll just do that. They get a little bit up here and then they just get smacked down and then just go, well, that doesn't work. That's all crap. You know, none of this free man, straw man, sovereign, whatever thing works. It's all crap. And, you know, that's, I, I have a feeling it was kind of done that way on purpose. Maybe there was just some greedy people that led people astray as well. But I know that that's happened. It's really important not to mix jurisdictions. So what happens is the dead can't see the living and the living can't see the dead. So if you walk into a courtroom or you notice a corporation, which is a dead entity, corp meaning dead, or rate meaning to speak, corporation, dead man speaking. Uh, if you are a government or uh, a courtroom, these are all the realm of fiction. So if you go in there and you start saying things like, I'm a man, I have rights, I have this, I have this, you can't do this, whatever, I'm free. You're mixing jurisdictions. You're trying to say that you're living, but the dead can't see the living. So I've seen people go into courtrooms and say that and then get kicked out and psych tested because they're essentially insane. They're trying to say <laughs> that they're living to the dead. So then that, that means that somebody might have read a lot of stuff on the internet or gone to a seminar and been told the wrong thing and got themselves into trouble. You can't mix jurisdictions. You just have to know how to reserve your rights. So if you walk into a courtroom and they say, are you Mr. Such and such? And you, you don't have to say, no, I'm a living man. You're going to be deemed insane and incompetent and kicked out and you'll lose. You could just say, well, I answer to that name, but I reserve all of my rights and I waive all benefits and privileges. That means you are now operating on their level, but you are operating by holding on to your rights, which is the most important thing. You can retain your rights without incriminating yourself. In the same vein, you can't, there's a biblical uh, principle, I think it's Matthew, book of Matthew, that says the truth is uh, the truth is only told or spoken out of the mouths of two or more people. And us as individuals are not two or more people, so we can't tell the truth. Therefore, you need a second witness. That's why if you go into court or you're talking to a police officer or you're writing a notice, instead of making claims, because the a maxim of law is that whoever makes the claim bears burden of proof. So if you make a claim, you have to back it up. So what you want to do is make the other people make claims and fail to back it up. So instead of saying, I'm a man and I do this, you say, do you have any evidence that I'm not a man? So now you're putting the onus of the burden of proof on them. If they can't prove that you're not, which they can't, then you are. By your second witness, more than two, two or more people have now stated that you're a man by assent. So that's, it's kind of like these little nuances that I think people think this stuff doesn't work because they've, they've failed but they just haven't quite understood it fully. So there's the, just mixing jurisdictions is one of the most important things that you can't do. You, if you, you can't, if you're writing a notice, you can't have like all caps somewhere and then title case somewhere else for a name. You just have to have it all in the same jurisdiction, but reserve rights going in and not make claims and make the other people make, make claims, which they mm -hmm. can't back up. And that's why, so the guy I learned this off more recently, I got into this 15 years ago as well failed in a lot of things, didn't manage to write off uh, traffic fines, didn't manage to write off uh, a lot of, didn't manage to stand my ground. I tried, but I failed a lot of times. And that's when I met this guy who's been doing it for 21 years and has 
a huge record of successes, has gone against the head lawyers of the ATO, at the Australian Tax Office, has gone against the head lawyers from the big banks, has gone against, uh, you know, has got magistrates and police fired, removed from their jobs. That's the guy that I've been learning off. And that's how I've learned about equity. And equity is the remedy in commerce. Equity supersedes common law. So people think that we're common law men and that, and we're, we're, but that's not quite the case because that's just dealing with case law. Equity is what is fair, what is equitable and what is just. And equity was introduced when common law was not giving the average man his remedy because it costs a lot of money to run a court case, have a jury, and then to create a new case law precedent for common law to be able to protect the average guy who's just been wronged on a small scale. So that's why equity was brought in and that's why equity is the remedy for people to, um, I guess, hold their ground in commerce. And uh, yeah, look, I mean, it's the, I, can't, I can't charge people. You know, it's, it's a weird thing because people hear you talk and then they start contacting you. Oh, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? And I, I just say, well, no, because if I will not help somebody with something I haven't done personally, I'm not going to say, look, it should work because I know I've done this and it should apply to that. I, it's just not worth it because if they don't do it right, they're going to get in trouble. And to the same token, I can't monetize it either. It just doesn't feel right. So it's kind of one of those weird things where I'm happy to talk about it, but I, I think I've got to lead. If people want to know more about it, I've just got to give them a resource to go to and learn for themselves because there's something that, you know, I don't, I don't see the value in. Like you said, you know, people trying to get rich out of this sort of thing, which a lot of people have tried. Actually, a funny, what's well, not funny, the guy that I learned from, he teaches people how to discharge mortgages. It's a lot di more difficult than discharging a credit card or a, any other kind of debt. So this lady, a husband and wife came to one of his seminars, went to one seminar, then went out of that seminar and started a business helping people discharge their mortgage, charged people $50,000. To, to discharge their mortgages. And you think if you've got a $500,000 mortgage or you can pay someone 50 grand and they'll get rid of it, that's kind of like tempting for most people. So they got about 10 or 15 people in the first month. Every single one of them failed. Every single mm -hmm. one of them got in massive trouble with their bank. These people collected like a few hundred thousand dollars in their fees of $50,000 for each person. And then the guy who taught them found out and had to go in and fix all that for free because they'd already done all their money and couldn't afford. And it's just like a, it's really sad when people take this sort of stuff and they want to just be greedy with it. And there's too many people that have given it a bad name because they've done it wrong. They haven't learned it in its entirety. So they send in notices and then they say, that doesn't work. I tried to discharge this and it didn't work. I tried to talk to a cop and I got arrested. You know, they haven't learned it properly. It, it's, it does serve us, but again, you have to do the work and you have to, um, you know, you have to really do your diligence with it. Well, yeah, we've just, seen that so often here in the States where people just become instant gurus and they're charging a lot of money. And, you know, with the basics, uh, there are just some simple rules. If you want to stay in your power, you never answer questions. You always yeah. ask questions. Uh, you never argue or dispute with somebody. If they make a statement or make a claim, you accept it conditionally. You say, okay, that's fine. I accept that if you can show me this, you know, under, I will accept those terms under the condition that you provide this. And, uh, you know, if I think if you just start with the basics, you're going to get a lot further, get in a lot less trouble, and then you can learn the more complex paperwork from there. Yeah. It's just remaining. Sorry, Mike, an honor. You're say something. Oh, I was just going to say, this is everything right now. I mean, this is, people are mind blown in chat right now and they're like, can't wait to go research this. And we'll drop some um, resources and, and, and all that in the show notes. Uh, if, if Tom wants to give us any or whatever. Uh, but this is everything because with the great, you know, people waking up due to everything going on right now, talk about self empowerment, understanding all that. If you do the work, you have the ability to really free yourselves from um, this, you know, basic servitude that we're born into. And um, I mean, talk about opening Pandora's box, Tom, if this really takes off. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's just so much we could talk about. Now, you, um, now you were running for, for office, right? And in, in, in on the political spectrum, uh, is, are you still involved with that? 
yeah, I'm still involved with the party. I haven't done anything for it. So the story with that is that um, it's a, they've changed, we've changed the name now. It's the, um, it was called the Involuntary Medication Objectors Party. And now it's the uh, Informed, Informed Medical Options Party, same IMOP. So anyway, what happened is that I live in what is considered the anti-vax capital of Australia. So mm-hmm. Byron Bay, Mullumbimby is where we have the highest uh, population of unvaccinated kids in the whole of the country. Um, our, the political party needed a, a candidate to run in this area who would A, do it and be able to stand up to the obvious, you know, uh, negativity coming their way and B, who isn't just a, a nutter. So there's, there, there's a lot of people in this area who are like the complete anti-vaxxer people and they'll just get out and yell at people and just they can't speak calmly and they can't speak from evidence or, uh, yeah, you know, so they wanted somebody who wasn't just going to be a complete, um, you know, uh, you know what I'm trying to get at. I oh yeah. I've been saying it politely. So, uh, so I said, yeah, I'll do it. So it was only, it was three weeks out from the election that I stepped up as a candidate, which means I had barely any lead time, but within a week I was on national news and, um, you know, as everybody wants to try to pick out an anti-vaxxer and, uh, and I don't even consider myself an anti-vaxxer. It's, uh, it's funny because several reporters from mainstream radio and uh, mostly radio and uh, newspapers uh, contacted me. They do a 20 minute or a half an hour interview and they wouldn't print it because I didn't give them anything that was going to make their story. <laughs> I just, just calmly handed all their questions, asked them why, why they thought I was an anti-vaxxer. What, what is an anti-vaxxer? What is science? What do you mean by truth? All these questions I just kept putting back on them. They couldn't answer them. And they, could, they didn't print a story. They, they couldn't get me to say anything that they could use to, um, you know, but I still got on national news for being an anti-vaxxer and whatever else, even though I never, you know, I, I think if people want to get vaccines, I say, hey, go for it. If you want to ask me what's in it and what I do, I'll tell you, but I'm not going to tell you not to do it, um, you know, so. Uh, yeah. I yeah, just, no, when you came out with that video about uh, terrain versus germ theory, that you got picked up on some Australian news thing and is like well known anti vaxxer yeah. Tom Barnett. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, no, I didn't know just, about that either. See, I, I barely used the internet. So I didn't find out that that video was popular until a day after I put it out and I had people ringing me telling me that it, they got sent it from America and Europe and everywhere else. And then I got told that I was on the news and then I got told that I was dead. Apparently I'd been taken out and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> but you know, I don't, I don't hear any of this stuff because I'm not, I don't like spend a lot of time online, but um, that was a really good experience running for office because we knew we weren't going to win firstly, because we were a, a new party and unknown. And second, I started three weeks out and also, um, you know, Australians, while there was a good amount of support in our local area, as a country, the, the majority of the country votes in the same two parties that they don't even know are all owned by the same people and <laughs> whatever else. They think that's a good idea. But um, what it did was it gave a large amount of uh, awareness. So that political campaign uh, reached a wide audience as far as awareness of issues of we brought up back then the issue of mandatory vaccines and what that would look like. And now we're actually facing um, the proposition of mandatory vaccines. I'm still quite confident it won't come in. All it is, is they'll say it's not mandatory, but if you want to have welfare, you have to get it. Or if you want to go to, you know, it's like, here's your benefits and privileges. And if you want these benefits and privileges, you have to do what we say. Um, that's kind of where the mandatory side of it's going to come in. They're never just going to turn up to your house, I don't think, and just try to jab you if you're not jabbed, you know, with the I military. I don't know. I mean, look at Washington, what's going on there with this. They're doing it not, not with the, the, the needle, but with the testing. And, yeah, uh, I've, heard, I've heard that too. But see, this is, where, this is where this whole understanding your rights comes in as well, because nobody has the authority to do that. And if you even answer to being a name you essentially subvert yourself to them. So they come to your door and they go, are you Mike Winner? And you say, yeah, then you kind of, and you don't reserve your rights in another way. You kind of give your power away uh, to them. So if somebody comes to your door, for example, and they say, are you Tom Barnett? I'd say no, because what they're after is a name. They're after an entity. I'm not the name. I answer to the name sometimes. So I would say, no, I don't know who you're after, but I'm I'm not who you're looking for. Go, well, doesn't he live here? I say, well, he might stop by here infrequently, but he's not, I'm not the guy you're looking for. So at the moment you're trespassing, I suggest you get off my property. Otherwise I'm going to charge you with trespass. So there's, you don't, there's ways to protect your rights from this potential, you know, um, 
invasion of yeah. authoritarian bodies. But unless people know how to do that, and again, going back to that, unless you see a lot of people will hear that and they go, well, I could do that. And then as soon as somebody comes to their door, are you such and such? Oh yeah. You know, they'll <laughs> learn it, but then it's not, they'll just, you know, oh, here's my license. Oh, I'm that name. Yes. Yes, sir. No, sir. They'll start answering questions, you know? Like Barry said, you can't answer questions. They might say, well, you know, aren't you the such and such? I don't answer questions. No, no, are you? So no, I don't answer questions. Now, with respect, do you have a warrant to be here? I, did I invite you here? Otherwise, you're trespassing. I suggest you get off my property. And you just need to know how to put it back on people. Some people, in all honesty, don't have that in them. Um, by na- I'm sure everybody can learn it. But again, you're going to have to put that effort in. So this is kind of that, that thing where I don't like to talk about this like it's the solution to everything because it's not the solution. You as an individual are the solution to all of your problems. So you as an individual have to develop that ability to stand up for yourself if you don't have it already. And then, it, and then what you speak will have more, more uh, influence. But until then, if you're not... I've, uh... Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Tom. Finish. Well, I was just going to say, if you're, not, if you're not somebody who can stand up for themselves just by nature, it doesn't matter what you say. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like it, it could work to a degree, but you just need to have it in your inside of you before you can speak the words and the words have the effect that you want. So I suggest people learn it because it is a solution, but you, you need to be the solution first before, you know, uh, laws and um, words are your solution. Yeah, I had an encounter. I was just going to say where uh, somebody was asking me if I was uh, this person that they had a, a photo ID of me to identify me. And they said, well, is this not you? And I said, I don't know. That's, that's not me. You know, and of course, I'm thinking inside, that's, that's a picture. That's not me. And is this a picture of you? I don't know. I don't know where you got that thing. So you just, again, you never answer questions. And you never identify because what they're trying to do is identify you with the fiction and you're not a fiction. So it's, again, you go back to the simplistics and, and you save yourself a lot of grief. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. They're trying to get you to answer to being a name so that then you take on what they're trying Mm -hmm. to give to the, give to the name. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a concept that people need to get their heads around because if you've been alive for 30, 40, 50 years, and you've thought one way, it's hard to undo that overnight, but it's just, uh, it's, it's a process, but it's up, up to the, each individual to choose to take that process. Yeah, it seems like the one restriction that's a little worrisome for me is the traveling, and we've seen it in Argentina already with doing the, these passports. And, um, you know, it's like, how are we going to get around that if they're going to be requiring this uh, to travel? You know, that's that's a bummer to not be able to fly. And I guess people say, well, get your own airplane. Well, people can't afford to do that. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? If they're going to be restricting travel? Uh, okay, I've got three potential solutions for that. The first is to, I mean, it's probably going to not matter anyway, but I was going to say uh, an airplane is kind of a benefit and a privilege. They're privately owned machines by companies. The companies kind of have the right to say what you can and can't do, who they want on their planes and not because they're privately owned. Um, you know, you could go by boat. That's just, for example. Now, that probably won't matter too because you've got to go through customs when you get to a port. Same kind of deal, right? But here's the two solutions that actually matter. One is your passport. You want to reserve your rights when you get a passport. Now, a passport is essentially a benefit and a privilege, but travel is an inherent right. We have the right to travel. And if you look on the... I don't think I have mine here. If you look on the inside of a passport, the very inside cover, it says... So I have an Australian one, which is a Commonwealth passport, but the American one will be the same. It says any Commonwealth official who is a police, border, uh, customs, anybody must aid the bearer of the passport in their travel. They cannot impede that travel at all or that's a Commonwealth offence. That's like an offence to the Crown. So um, just that alone can get you out of things. But what you really need to do is reserve your rights. Now, what happens, just to give a bit of background, is when you get a passport, you sign for it. Now, when you sign for something, you, you're creating an agreement. So what you've done, you haven't probably read it, but there's all the terms and conditions and codes that go along with having a passport. We, we give you this passport on these conditions. If you do this, we can do this. If you do this, it's an offense, we can do this. And you sign for it, which creates an agreement. Now, 
The difference between a, an agreement and a contract is that a contract needs a meeting of minds. It needs uh, five things I can't think of off the top of my head, but it needs consideration. Consideration is payment. So you turn an agreement into a contract when you add payment. So you know that you pay for your passport application. Apply meaning to beg, by the way, in legalese. You do an application. Application means to apply and apply means to beg. So you're essentially begging for the state's benefits and privileges when without it, you have the right to travel already. You don't need that benefit and privilege, but you're begging for it and you create an agreement, you create a contract with the state when you sign for and pay for a passport. Now, the way that you can reserve your rights going in is that you sign all rights reserve. I wish I had have actually written one out, but I'll explain how to do it. There's the box that you sign in, right? Hmm. Now, if you pick up an English styles manual, you'll learn that anything in a box isn't there. <laughs> That's why in your birth certificate and that everything's in boxes, whatever's in a box technically isn't there, but that doesn't matter for this anyway. That's just a bit of kind of interest. So inside that box is where you sign. You know, you can't sign out of it because they use that whatever's in the box to print onto the passport. So what you want to do in, to reserve your rights is do this on from in the way you would normally write, you would write by B Y. So capital B, small Y by means by accommodation. And that now means that you are signing by accommodation of the name you are taking control and ownership of the intellectual property which is your name you're not being the name now so you write by and then underneath by you write all rights reserved capital a l l and then the rest are just small letters rights reserved so it'll say by and then all rights reserved still in that box then when you do your signature you do your signature and it touches the all rights reserved yeah. the reason it needs to touch it is that they can be sneaky and crop your signature out and not include the all rights reserved but if your signature touches it, they can't crop it out because it'll show a crop signature and they'll be like, why is my signature cropped? So by BY, underneath that, all rights reserved. Above the all rights reserved, do you squiggle? Make sure everything is inside that box. So on a driver's license where the box is this small, you have to write it real small. But as long as you write it, you now enter into that contract, reserving, keeping intact your rights. It means you now don't come under their statutory laws and codes and whatever that they've written into the contract because now you have entered a contract but with your rights intact so now if you travel around with an all rights reserved license uh license driver's license and passport that immediately brings you much higher up in the standing of being able to you know somebody says oh well you can't come into that you say well really well you show me where you have authority over an all rights reserved passport holder they don't have that authority so when they can't come up with that source of authority they first of all they can lose their job straight away and or they can be uh fined under full commercial liability we're dealing in commerce they have to have public liability insurance if they go against their codes of conduct and misrepresent themselves then they can be held liable commercially which means up to 10 million dollars or more of commercial liability and or loss of job and uh, anything else so the law is in our favor if we learn how to use it the problem with the all rights reserved thing is that again, if you speak the wrong words, when you're doing that, you can inadvertently incriminate yourself as well, which lessens its effectiveness. But what the real solution is, Mike, is that it needs, we need a hundred thousand people to do this at one time, a million people, 10 million people to do this at once, because with that kind of numbers, they can't turn around and say, it's kind of easy to flick off me and you and the next person few of us here and there it's kind of easy to flick them off but with a huge number of people going no we don't want that anymore we want the right to travel that is our right we want to reserve our rights and we're doing it then that system only operates and is successful because we allow it that's the only reason so if if enough of us step up and say no we have rights we want to keep our rights you can keep your benefits and privileges and unless you can prove you have authority over us we're going to take it we're going to take you up on that and uh, make you liable and all that sort of stuff. That's the only thing that's going to stop them is that um, yeah, people with the, In the States here, even in the, sorry, I was going to say in the States here, even in the Department of Motor Vehicles code, it distinguishes between uh, traveling and driving. If you're driving, you're commercial. And, um, you know, there, there's processes with that. Also in the States, uh, you can um, get a passport as an American national. It's a bit of a complex process, but it's definitely possible. No matter what you do, though, it always ends up the biggest challenge when you're on the side of the road with 
a cop who's on an ego trip that doesn't care what you do. And then, of course, the last thing you want to do is get in a beef with a cop, you know, in the middle of the night somewhere. And at that point, uh, you know, it's just a matter of staying calm and, and uh, not getting into it with them. Yeah. So, well, yeah, it's, uh, it, well, I, I it, agree. It's about getting numbers of people that are educated. In the States, too, can't you do, uh, file a, a passport and, as a state sovereign? versus uh, your, your social security number? Bear, do you know about that? Um, it, it's, it's more complex than that. It okay. used to be that as long as you just didn't uh, check the box citizen, then you could um, you know, pass for uh, uh, an American national, but they made that very difficult. And every state at one point used to have an option that you could exercise if you knew about it. That's all been negated. But there's uh, one state now that uh, allows you to do it. So no matter where you live in the states, you could be in California. But if you fill out the paperwork, uh, I believe it's uh, Minnesota, then um, you can do this whole passport option. But again, you can show this paperwork to a cop and you know it's 50-50 depending who you get. A lot of times, and, and I've done other processes in the past where you get a cop that gets it and they just go, okay, drive safe and they let you go. And then the next time you get an idiot. So, um, yeah, it's the uh, last thing you want to do is uh, educate cops. And the cops, of course, now are a different breed than they used to be. They're all these people that come back from Desert Storm or the last war, and they're not peace officers anymore. They've been reclassified as uh, leos you know uh, law enforcement agents which means they're protecting the interests of private corporations and not working for us anymore so it's 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 a touchy situation again it goes back to numbers we need numbers of aware people and the last thing i just wanted to comment on with all the legal processes and the paperwork uh you know a lot of people are always asking me well should i learn this or that and i say you know we're at a time historically where I believe we don't have time for that. And I believe why some of us went through that years ago was to create an awareness of the fact that basically we're all getting hosed and deceived. And it's like, okay, we get that now. So, so now it's a matter of just coming into our truth on another whole dimension and, uh, you know, uh, you know, the gentleman we had on last time, Josh, uh, you know, he has a process of non-consent and I'm saying, yeah, I'm all for it. Anything that's going to get people together, but it's not about the paperwork anymore. I don't believe you have time to go through what I went through and, and take the arrows that we took in the process. It's about people just coming together because we live in a whole different time. Things are moving very quickly. And if you understand these concepts, I think that's the most important thing is to understand what's been done. But now it's a matter of getting together and not worrying about the paperwork so much. But that's just what I feel. I, you might have a totally different, you know, idea on that. No, I, I agree. I think it's, yeah, time is, time is limiting factor here. So I, I still think file the notices because what that does is it puts them on, it shows, it shows how many people are not standing for it, you know? And it, that just, just that intention that putting that out, that energy putting out is going to have an effect. Um, it's not the solution, but it's going to have a part of an effect. But I agree a hundred percent that it's, it takes more people just to handle the cop thing. And everybody says that they go, well, that might be the law. But when I turn up at customs with my passport, they don't like the, the guy making $18 an hour, who's there with a gun on his holster. He doesn't know that, you know, what if he just decides, and that's a good point. But so what happens is anybody working in a public capacity, police, customs, anybody has to carry public liability insurance and that's their Achilles heel. So what happens is um, when you are, uh, I got arrested a week ago, right? I was driving on the, uh, in the next state up and long story short, I, I haven't had a license for a long time. It's never usually an issue, but I was driving an unregistered car, which I didn't know about. I got pulled over because they have auto detect on number plates. I got pulled over. The guy says, oh, you're such and such. You're driving unlicensed. And I'm going, oh, really? Have you got evidence for that? Like, how do they know who I am? I, I think I was getting targeted in a way too, because I've got a bit of a name now and people know who I am around here. But uh, 
anyway, so I say, oh, really? You have some evidence for that? Actually, back up. <laughs> first thing I did, they followed me for about 10 minutes. They waited till I was in a dark street before they pulled me over. They wouldn't pull me over on a main road. Wait till I was in a dark street. I knew they were going to pull me over because they were following me for that long. So as I'm waiting for it. As soon as their lights go on, I jump out of my car and run to their car. I go, are you guys all right? <laughs> they, go, okay? they, go, they go, yeah, no, we're all right. I go, so you're okay, right? You don't need my assistance? They go, no, no, we're okay. So good, because I saw your emergency lights. Now, the police are only supposed to turn those lights on in an emergency, right? So I saw your emergency lights. So I just want to make sure you're okay. But if you're okay, I've done my duty of care. You do have a duty of care. I've done my duty of care. I'm going to be off now. See you later. I start to walk back to my car. And these big, uh, you know, like ex-military guys, way bigger than me, both get in front of me, stop me getting to my car. Yeah, well, you're an unlicensed driver. I said, oh, really? Am I? Do you have some evidence for that? And so they, they keep trying to say that, get me to say that I'm me, which I wouldn't do. They go, well, we're going to arrest you. I said, really, really, that's going to be a false arrest and a false detainment then. And um, so then I said, they go, well, we want to see your ID. I said, well, I want to see your ID. So who, who are you anyway? So I just see two guys in this car here and it's the middle of the night. You know, I don't feel safe here. Who are you? You know, if you have some authority, I want to see it. And we didn't have to show you that. I said, really? <laughs> I said, so, so I just have to take your word for it that you're bona fide police officer. So would you show your ID to just anybody? Like, wouldn't you want to, wouldn't you want to see that somebody has authority or that they're, they're who they say they are? You just take everyone's word for it. Is hearsay evidence now? So we didn't have to show you that. I said, well, okay, well, look, if you arrest me, that's a false arrest and false attainment. I'm going to charge you with those to start with. Then there'll be a, a charge for assault and obstruction as well. And um, then I said, um, I want to see your ID. Said no. I said, Are you telling me you're not going to show me your ID? I said, I want to see a business card. And I'm, and you know, see, without that, you're out of uniform. It means you're personating a police officer. That's an offence, and I'm going to charge you with that. So what the they didn't let me get to the next step. They said they're just going to arrest me, right? So they did. They went to put handcuffs on me. Said, Be real careful. I've got injured shoulders. If you wreck it, that's another charge. And they said, Don't resist. And I said, Okay, look, I'm not going to resist. I said, I'm going to comply, but I'm going to comply under duress and threats of menace. I think you're personating police officers. You're, you're causing several offences here. I'm not going. I'm not going to. Um, I'm not going to resist though. So I didn't yell. I didn't raise my voice. I didn't swear at him. I kept calm. And all I did was just stated, "Look, you're refusing to produce identification. I don't know who you are. I'm going to com comply because you have guns, but I'm going to charge you with these charges. And I'm only complying under duress and threats of menace. That's something you need to notice people with. Then they put me in the back of their car, and it went back and forth. They told me they were going to take me to the police station. All this. After I noticed them on a few other things and I showed them my passport, then they backed off a bit. And um, anyway, the point is, is that you might get arrested. You, some things like this might happen. But what happens is I'm getting there, which they wouldn't give me. I said, I want your business card and I want your indemnity insurer number on your business card. Why do you want that? Well, you work in a public capacity, which is my understanding that you're required to carry a business card as part of your uniform. If you don't have that, you're out of uniform. That's a federal offense. So that also it's my understanding you work for a corporation. As such, you're required to carry personal and public indemnity uh, liability insurance. So I want your indemnity insurance number because I'm going to be pressing some charges and that's their Achilles heel, right? So they didn't give it to me, which is another offense. So basically what's happened is they've done an arrest. It's a false arrest. They let me go and a false detainment, several charges. And I'm in the process of putting in a complaint to their superiors and finding out the number of their indemnity insurer and putting a complaint with them. Likelihood is they're both gonna lose their jobs within a couple of weeks. So the guy I lent this off has got, like I said, five or six police and magistrates from like judges fired from their position because once that goes to the attorney general, if they've shown any form of misconduct, they're gone. So um, this, is the, this is, again, this is not something the average person's gonna comprehend right now or know how to do, but when you've done this for some time, you can ask anybody acting in a public capacity for their indemnity insurer number their details who is it what's their number what's their code all that sort of stuff they have to carry it they cannot be operating in that capacity without it so what's going to happen is if they refuse to give a source of authority they say you can't cross this border because you haven't got your shots we want to scan you we have this you know your vaccines whatever unless they can provide a source of authority they're going against their code of conduct you can put in a complaint to their indemnity insurer and they'll, you'll, you'll win money. You'll like, I plan to win money in court against these police officers. If I want to go that way, I might not. I'll, I'll see you got to weigh up the energy it takes to put into something in the return and all that sort of stuff. Uh, is it your ego trying to prove a point or, you know, all that kind of thing. You got to weigh all these things up. Yeah. 
But long story short, it's just the indemnity insurance is the Achilles heel of anybody working in a public capacity and pretending to have authority over anybody with a, over any man or woman who inherently has rights and especially somebody with an all rights reserved driver's license, passport or anything like that. And as you said, you don't even need one to travel. You only need a license if you're conducting commerce. All these things come under acts and acts only applied to persons. I've asked this, I asked this to police officers too when I got arrested. I said, I said, what are you trying to, you try to tell me I can't, I can't travel around here. They said, oh, there's this quarantine. I think really, I said, well, what's the source of authority? They said, oh, it's the this, that and the other act 2005. I said, oh, that's an act, isn't it? They go, yeah. I said, am I a man? They go, what? I said, no, that's not the answer to the question. That's a yes or no answer. I said, am I a man? Well, I don't know. I don't know. You're a, you're a whatever. <laughs> I said, well, I'm like, am I a banana? Like, so third times, third and final time, right? You have to notice three times. Said so third and final time, am I a man? Well, I don't know. You're you're like, you're like, you're alive or whatever. So oh, right, so I'm living, right? I'm not dead yet. So we have agreement. I'm a man. So you just said that your source of authority is an act. How does an act apply to a man? And they just went, like, well, well we have to. No, no, no. The question is, how does an act apply to a man? So unless you can provide some kind of evidence for that claim, I'm going to hold that against you. So anyway, that's all recorded. I'm, I'm getting the recordings that they took of that because police have video and audio recordings. So basically there's all these recordings of them incriminating themselves and I'm going to use that against them. And in, at no stage did I incriminate myself, which is important. Again, your listeners aren't going to get any of this really, <laughs> but it's good to kind of know and get I've an actually, idea. What's I've, out I've actually witnessed that happen where um, uh, an officer had their bond leaned and uh, the insurance company would no longer, you know, they're not bondable anymore. So they couldn't work in the public. They lost their job. Yeah, that's, that's what happens. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's, so actually, again, there's actually, Tom, there are people in the States that are going out and practicing this. Um, okay. there's, there's YouTube videos now that are being shared in our Telegram group with people literally, and in the UK too, I've seen where they're literally going out because that's how you're, you're talking about not incriminating yourself you know, going up to security guards, not as high stakes and practicing it, like literally like going to basketball practice or something so they can like yeah. get in the mode of it. And be, uh, because it does, as you're saying, as you're alluding to, it takes practice to uh, be able to stand your ground and not incriminate yourself. So that does make sense to go out and kind of practice it on lower stakes stuff. But I, we yeah. have been noticing that there's actually been a lot of chatter in our telegram group, a little shout out to our telegram group about this every day right now people are really waking up to this right now um right. For, forgive me i'm losing light in my office right now i'm slowly disappearing here uh i don't like turning on my bright office light i prefer no lights uh but anyways yeah um that's really cool man that uh we would love keep us in the loop on how this this all turns out okay i really appreciate yeah well yeah yeah actually and something that's important to do as well is to remain in honor like barry said was before you've got to remain in honor you, you go into dishonor when you argue when you um, don't answer questions, you, you cannot answer, but remaining silent is dishonorable. You just have to say, I don't answer questions. Then you're answering the question without answering, et cetera. But when you're dealing with somebody who's like a low level agent, operative, somebody that's on minimum wage, the way to get around is just, you, you still have to remain in honor. So I'm still very calm with them. If they don't let me through a border block or something, I say, hey, look, I know you're just doing your job, but look, I just have a duty of care. So I say that to them. I just have a duty of care to inform you that if you don't provide evidence of the claims you're making, you can get in a lot of trouble. Look, you can probably lose your job. That's probably the, 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 the uh, lesser of evils that's going to happen. The other thing that's going to happen is you might be liable for a lot of money. So I'm just noticing you as my duty of care. If you don't let me through, if you don't provide some sort of evidence, it's not going to, you know, I don't, I don't want to see something bad happen to you because I know you're just doing your job. Because a lot of these people, they're not out to get you. They're doing what they're told. What they're told is wrong, but they don't know that. So if main honor and you don't just become one of those you can't do anything to me people and you know you, you, you act in a dishonorable way then things will work out for you if not like that didn't work out for me when i got arrested in the short term on that I, they wasted an hour of my time but in the long term it will work out in my favor so again if that happened to every single man or woman they pulled over that's game over for them you know it's only like the odd guy doing it now but like you said, hopefully more people are waking up. They're going out practicing this and they're doing it. But imagine every single, they wouldn't bother pulling people over anymore. What would be the point? You know, they can't deal so, with that amount of people. So Tom, just as a final question, you've been really generous with your time here. And um, 
when you exercise your will force that way, uh, we like to talk about this a lot in our talks, how does that translate into your biological health? It's huge. Yeah, absolutely. That it's, it's, it's very, um, it's almost like you are coming from, it's like you have come some, some fire that's ignited inside and it's not a destructive fire. It's just a strong energy that just permeates everything. It's like all your cells resonate more strongly. It's just, it's something that is, it's the opposite of the fear. Like we were talking about at the start where that fear mentality, oh, I'm going to eat an apple in case I get sick. You know, like you said, it's like, no, I want to eat an apple because I, I love apples and they make me feel good and they make me feel healthy, not because I don't want to get sick. It's a completely different way of looking at something. So when you start to exercise your rights, instead of being somebody who's at the mercy of everyone outside of them, it just creates, it's that same place of being that you come from. So it makes you stronger internally. It makes you cleaner internally. It makes you healthier, more vibrant because you now are a, uh, you know, you can't be, can't be touched maybe your physical body can but the part of you that's eternal and is just experiencing a brief physical existence that's just burning strong you know so that creates a healthier body in which you uh, inhabit excellent bingo wow what a uh, amazing show today uh the chat has just been lively people are uh minds being blown so we thank <laughs> we thank for that tom it's really been a pleasure and we're coming up on two hours so i think we could probably nip it in the bud i mean we could talk there were so many other things i wanted to get into but um you know you've been so generous with your time so we appreciate it and for those listening um if you are enjoying this please give us a like subscribe share do all those wonderful things help get this information out the more people that can get this information the sooner we can get that hundred monkey effect and see the world really um change into some place that uh, is really uh, going to be a lot more uh, pleasurable to, so we don't have to do these things, right? But you do make a great point, Tom, and that's like, also, the, this world is, this reality has this polarity for a reason. It's for our soul to be challenged, and we, without challenge, um, we wouldn't be here. So uh, even if we can have this great revolution, it's, there's always going to be something that we're going to be challenging ourselves with, but wouldn't it be better if it was just Qigong and athletics and and all the, and arts and, and all that stuff, which would we all want to do, like not just be constantly worrying about looking over our shoulder to see if big brother is going to get us. So anyways, really appreciate the time. Um, for those that enjoyed this talk, you can join us on telegram t.me forward slash alpha Vedic. we got a, a very vibrant growing community there. We talk about this kind of stuff all day long, go to alpha Vedic.com. We've got our new site launching on Monday. We've got our new life force protein line that's been totally revamped, our essential oil line with the new carbon 60 citrus CBD and the black seed carbon 60. And then our, of course our Illumin line that's coming out. The Illumin line is going to be next kind of our next big thing. And that'll be coming out in a couple of weeks. Um, check out our of course, our Jiao Gulong, our signature crop that we grow. The immortality teas are fantastic. Really some of the best teas in the world, all grown here up on the Smith river uh, in beautiful Northern California. So thanks for listening. Go to alphavedic.com for more information. And Tom, um, any place that you would like people to go to, to learn more about you, we'll of course put them in the show notes as well, but what's the best place to find you and everything you're all about? Uh, I kind of dropped off the radar a few years ago. Never got back <laughs> on. I, just, I, just, <laughs> I got, I got a bit famous, uh, and not, not prepared for it. I've got two sites. I've got, um, Global Biodynamics, I still have the site uh, active. You can find me there, uh, globalbiodynamics.com. I have uh, an ebook available and another one I'm writing that's available at a site called barnettbooks.shop. And you can find me on Instagram at barnett.media. Um, I think I'm going to start posting more about the things that I talk about. At the moment, it's just photography, but um, yeah, I think it's time I've got to start getting involved in the whole online world now as well. I think enough people are asking. So, I'll, I'll start to be more present on there as time goes on. Well, we'd love to have you. And just so you know, we're developing uh, myself. I, I'm, my main thing I focus on is decentralization, blockchain, cryptocurrency, that kind of stuff. And, and I'm involved with a team that's been working for six years on a new project called Cordal coming out that uh, is fully, its aim is to decentralize web hosting, blogs, all this in a way that is really empowering and easier to do as far as the whole protocol. So long story short, 
I don't blame you for not wanting to be online because they're all basically gulags as is right now. You get yeah. kind of, you know, the, the, the fake books and, the, and, and all those out there. But we do see the light at the end of the tunnel, even online and having a decentralized place of freedom without the censorship. And that's what we're really rooting for and what we're looking forward to. So we would love to have you join us there because yeah. your, your message and your voice and everything is it, the world needs you. And um, we would hate to see, I mean, I don't blame you bears the same way. He would love to just be on the farm and <laughs> not be out there, but it's kind of like the world needs us right now. So uh, we'll, we'll stay in touch, man. And I'll make sure to get you that information. Yeah, definitely do that for sure. Okay. And bear Lando, uh, always amazing uh, today. Uh, any parting words for the community? No, just uh, thanks everybody for being here. And thank you, Tom. Uh, you're a light to the world and you're doing a wonderful service. Thanks. Amazing. Okay, guys, have a wonderful evening or day wherever you are in the world. And as we always say, make sure to get outside and start growing your own food or start a garden, get in nature, go for a walk, a hike, a swim, whatever. Just get out there every day and enjoy mother. Enjoy this beautiful Gaia garden planet that we live on. Love you guys and cheers. <laughs>